Thanks everyone for coming. Um, today we're going to talk about LGBTQ community uh, movement in Taiwan. A um, little introduction about Irish for Taiwan. Um, it was started about three years ago. Uh, me and my co-founder, we were um, both in TASA back in college, and we realized that a lot of a lot of times when people talk about Taiwan, they talk about food, you know, at night market, bubble tea. So we wanted to bring a little bit more to the Taiwanese culture so people can learn a little, a little bit more, more than just food and whatnot. And we expand a lot upon um, trying to avoid to be as less political as possible, but if we pl present political points, we try to be as unbiased or bipartisan as possible. And then, um, so ever since then, we've we have an article, we, um, social, social media, we post articles that are relevant to our cause. Our, our website also has a couple of basic information about Taiwan. And um, our main point is, though, is that we go to different schools and we give like, workshops just like this. And it's all with specific topics talking about Taiwan, certain different areas. So in the past, we've had history of foreign rule, um, the civil, uh, civil, civil, uh, civil movements, um, what was that, U.S. Taiwan China relations, and um, today is our debut of the LGBTQ movement workshop. And with that note, um, disclaimer, uh, so organization, none of us are like, like we're not specialists in these areas. Um, we just kind of, the large part of us doing this is that we wanted to show that just pretty much anyone, you can find the information, it's a lot of work, to be honest, um, but you know it's doable, so we want to gather this information for you guys. So at any point, if anyone finds any of this information kind of like off or weird, I would strongly suggest go on the websites, look it up yourselves too, and then just come back and be like, Eric, you're wrong, you know. But we would like we would like nothing better to like someone like letting us know like, hey, just by the way, this information is not right. Um, so as a disclaimer, but we do try to gather resources from um, you know credible resources, and as well, and especially this topic today, um, we of individuals who are knowledgeable in the area. Um, and at the end of this power presentation, I, we're going to have um, a, someone come on the line to talk to you guys. She's very involved in the LGBTQ movement in Taiwan as well, too. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys a basic download, and then if there are any questions that I can't answer, say them, and then um, she can answer them for you. She's actually, oh, so another disclaimer, I guess, is that I'm recording all this, so is anyone really not comfortable with being or anything. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, that's the camera right there, so the dinosaur looking thing. But, um, and also just the slides. Uh, so she's actually watching online, so if there are any questions, I'm sure she'll note it down and she can probably answer them later. And also telling her that if I say anything wrong, she can correct me as well. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so to start off with, kind of wanted to show um, a video clip from the Pride Parade. So this is the 2016 um, LGBT. Um, Pride Parade in Taipei. Oh, That's not the. Sorry. We are not sponsored by T Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Brown your internet, your <laughs> but um, there's so the Pride Parade started in 2000 and um, to this is 2016. In 2016, it was recorded up to 80,000 people who attended the Pride Parade. <laughs> So this is how, like, in like the core of downtown Taipei, and this the march ends up in front of the presidential office as well, too. <laughs> they have it in other areas, but like um, Taipei is like the, the main, the main big one. So um, this is kind of like 
the whole thing's like five minutes long, so I just cut a little bit of it off. But this is kind of to show that the general support for the LGBT community has grown significantly in the past um, 20 or so years. Um, so this is an article from uh, Taiwan Sentinels. Uh, they did a little like, independent study. They got um, 600, uh, 601 Taiwanese respondents to you know, answer some questions by questionnaires. And essentially, they realized that the support for legalization is at like 40%. Um, 27% oppose it, and 32% neither support nor oppose um, legalization of um, gay marriage. So the general feel of things in Taiwan, or like the general public, is pretty, pretty, um, pretty good on, on marriage equality law being passed. Um, so then this started getting a lot of extra coverage, even from the international team as well, too. So this is a little bit of from. CBS. Taiwan appears to be moving closer to allowing same sex marriage. This tiny island nation would be the first in Asia to in fact allow it. In Taipei, Taiwan will take a closer look at what is driving this historic movement. While same sex marriage has made progress in the West, here in the East, in Asia, it's not legal anywhere. In fact, homosexuality is a criminal offense in some countries. But here in more liberal Taiwan, the active gay community has Passions over gay marriage are on regular display here in Taipei, Taiwan's cosmopolitan capital. Pro-gay activists continue to push for marriage equality, including last month at a temple where locals pray for marriage. Partners Shang Wen and Kang Nam were there and say the legalization of gay marriage would show the world Taiwan cares about human rights. How would you feel if you could make it official by law, have a ring, be married, have a marriage license? I think it's like a very popular to block a ring. I think you had to uh, responsible for your, your husband and maybe uh, our, our children in the future. Taiwan's already known around Asia for its acceptance of gays and lesbians. It hosts Asia's largest pride parade. 80,000 attended this year's celebration. This temple was founded as a refuge for gays and lesbians, where at least 20 people a day come and pray for love. Its very existence is a symbol of Taiwan's open society. On display last month on Human Rights Day, when supporters flooded the streets outside the presidential office building. At night, the building was even lit in rainbow colors. The president inside What's his name? What's his has also spoken out in support. But the island is still divided. Show you Chen with the Alliance of the Next Generation's Happiness says children like his son need a parent of each gender. And if you have two mothers or two fathers, what effect would you have? I believe every child needs a father and a mother, and the father is a man, the father, mother is a woman. They provide different love, and they combine with a whole structure, healthy structure. A November poll found that while 46% of Taiwanese support marriage equality, 45% oppose it. And emotions are running high. Opponents <coughs> and supporters faced off in late December during competing protests in downtown Taipei. Whether or not one of the pending bills becomes law doesn't depend on who's louder. It's up to the lawmakers in office. <coughs> Activists say a decision could come this spring <coughs> in the legislative session. But a ruling party lawmaker told us the issue is so divisive, a vote could be put on hold. For CBSN, Adrian Diaz, Taipei, Taiwan. So um, everything's like kind of um, in debate right now. So today we're going to go through a little bit about you know why people are fighting for marriage equality. A lot of the stuff's going to be very overlapping with the, the states, but we're like, with the marriage equality arguments in the states. But we're going to try to focus on stuff that's a little bit you know unique to Taiwan itself too. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about how it came to, uh, um, what, like recently it became back on the spotlight, why it happened, and also the, the legal bills that are trying, that, that the gay community is trying to push through. Um, so the first bit that we wanna talk about is kind of, I think um, 
for like I was, as I was doing this myself too. Um, at first, you know, I thought it was just you know the ability to get married, but then there's actually a lot more than just about like consummation of a, a love between two people. So this is a little story from BBC about um, a, a gay couple and their children. Being gay is something that's natural to the children born with. I don't think now is the time for the law to be passed. <laughs> yeah. Women at a very young age. So it wasn't something that's affected by environment or you know bad influence or popular culture. Taiwan is quite accepting. So when people approach us on the street and they will ask us, you know, whether we're sisters, um, where's the daddy, um, and we, we tell them, like, very frankly, that uh, we are a gay family and these are twin babies. And for most people, you know, when we go to the market or it's like people who are around 50 or 60 year old, grandmas, and they've never heard of such thing. They're like, wow, I didn't know that's possible. And their reactions are mostly, wow, that, that, that's cool. We know that more than 100 couples with kids. I'm sure there, there are going to be more and more family exist that we don't know. So that's why we think it's very important to pass a law to protect the family like us. <coughs> if the law isn't passed yet, I don't personally I don't have a parental right for my lovely kids. And Cindy is the one who holds sole custodianship. And if something really bad happened to her, I'm not the one who can raise my kids up because the kids gonna send to foster care or whatever place, which is the biggest fear I'm having right now. So, um, like the beginning when I started researching about this, I was like, oh, you know, it's about the consummation of love between two people, but then it became a lot bigger than just simply getting married. Um, and the marriage equality has been pushed since the 2000s, um, mid 2000s, it's, um, but it really picked up steam recently in, in, 2000, in the last year. Um, on October 16th, um, Jacques Picou, I um, hope I'm pronouncing this right. But Professor Jacques Picou, um, who was you know, born and raised in France, but he came to Taiwan in 1979. Him and his uh, partner of 35 years um, uh, were together, and um, Jacques Picou committed suicide. And the reason why he committed suicide is because her, his partner had fallen ill and was sent to the hospital, and his, parents, uh, his family wanted to put... Um, his partner in life support. And it was like, you know, a very, honestly, kind of a painful experience. And Jacques Picou essentially said that, you know, I don't think, um, I don't think um, my partner wants to be, um, part, partner's name is um, Zhen Jingcao. So Zhen, like, I don't think Zhen would want to be um, on life support. But yet, because he has no, legally, he's just a stranger. The two of them are just strangers. He has absolutely no say into it. So the guy, um, his partner was put on life support. And after some time, the, um, he, was passed, he passed away. So Jacques, um, he was very upset about, um, uh, uh, kind of upset about the entire process and the fact that he couldn't be with, with his, uh, with his um, partner. And so he couldn't eat. And at a certain point, you know, he left off the building and committed suicide. This kind of brought this 
entire marriage equality thing into the big spotlight once again. Um, and Joao Picou also wasn't just another, just like a professor in some school too. He, you know, he was he was a French professor at um, National Taiwan University too, but but he was also known to be. Has anyone seen the movie The Assassin? Um, it's like a really artsy, filmy movie. Wang Can uh, from director Ho Xiaoxian from Taiwan. Um, so he actually, he's really, um, Jacques is really close with the director um, Ho, and he actually played a part in that as well too. And he was a lot of times a, the French translator for a lot of other directors as well too. So um, there's a little, this, this video is gonna be in Chinese, but I'm gonna try to take, like, talk over it. Oh, this is also from Apple Daily, so it gets kind of cutesy. So this is um, Jacques Picou in, in The Assassin. Um, he plays an a witch almost. So he jumped off a ten, ten story building and he was 68 when he passed away. He's um, like friends with a lot of other, he's a French direct, French translator for a lot of other directors as well, too, and lot, push a lot of French um, works as well, too. So that, Sun Jin's Hao, the, other, the guy on the left, was his partner. Um, he was also the manager or agent for um, Gong Li as well. <laughs> so there's a movie, it's like, oh, we're friends, we're really good friends, we've lived together for 30 years. But the guy goes like, yeah, but the, the patient has family and you're not family. So he, on his death, but he tried to, he got um, a lawyer to help with, to make sure that the apartment that they were living together would be given over to Jacques Picou as well. But like, you know, um, so they put him on life support and, and Jacques had no say into it. He passed away last year. I also told the, the the lawyer was like, if I ever passed away, I want my ashes to be with my partner and spread into the ocean. So she's another actress on the assassin, and she was, after this, she was saying like, oh, really hope marriage equity can go through. So. Okay. Um, so that kind of um, brought the marriage equality um, issues back on the surface again. You know, it was a, more of a, a starting into a little bit more public figure. And um, also with 2016 came a new administration as well, too. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the, how the politicians are dealing with it. But um, before we start getting into what's happened, I think it, it's a good part to look at the three bills that are proposed. So these are the three bills that are proposed by the Taiwan Alliance to promote civil partnership rights. Um, so uh, we're gonna go through each of them one by one. So but an, a quick little overview. The one on the very left is um, for marriage equality bill. The one in the middle is a partnership bill. And the one on the very right is um, called a family dependent bill. Um, so these are all online as well too, but mostly in Mandarin. But if there's any questions, let me know as well. Um, so first one to talk about is the Marriage Equality Act. This is the one that's been pushed the furthest. It's simple and complex at the same time. This is essentially, um, in the laws it says that marriage is between a man and a woman. It specifically says one man, one woman. So they're saying, well, just change that. Just say that the marriage is between not to sex or gender, for example. Um, there's different versions of this. It's either like between two people or between two people with no disregard to, with no disregards to um, gender, sexuality, or whatever. So there's different drafts that are going around, but the main idea is that to change the definition of marriage so that it's not just between one man and one woman. However, this would also require the changing of what we call the family laws, the the Ming Fa Jia Su Jia like So essentially, all the laws are saying like what pertains within a family. So it could be things like oh, um, like for example, like let's say divorce, whatever. It would say oh, divorces require you know uh, a husband and wife to agree. But if you say husband and wife, that implies that it's a one, one man, one woman. So there's going to be um, word change that has to be done. So for example, husband and wife will change to spouse, uh, father and mother will change to parents, man and woman will be changed to both parties, for example. So there's going to be a lot of things to, to change with it. Um, this law is strongly opposed by, by the people who oppose um, uh, marriage equality. The main reason why they're doing it is the main reason why this wants to be passed because they're saying you're changing the definition of what a marriage is 
and in turn also changing what the definition of family is. Um, so that's why a lot of people are very, like the people who are opposed to this are like saying like, no, like um, we don't support this. Like my concept of marriage, my concept of family, you can't change that. Um, so that's, this is the one that's being pushed through right now, um, is currently going through a second read. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how the, the legal processing goes. Um, next would be the same-sex partnership bill. So this is this essentially adds a like you know adds a certain part of the to, to the law about civil union between two individuals. This could be between you know two people of the same sex, um, sexual orientation, or it could be between two friends. I mean, if has anyone seen our now pronounced you Chuck and Larry? I want to talk about this really quickly. So I really, I really think it relates really quickly. So, in the movie, I now pronounce it Chuck and Larry. It, it stars um, Adam Sandler and I don't know the other guy's name, Kevin something. Um, really fat, chubby dude. Um, so essentially, in it, they're both firefighters, and uh, Kevin's character essentially says, um, "I'm scared that when I'm firefighting, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. My like, wife left me, and I just have my two kids." Um, I want to make sure that my two kids are are well taken care of. So he tells his best friend Larry, was like, oh, I don't um, Adam Sandler characters, be like, let's get married. And he goes, like, wait, like, this is like this movie's kind of old. So they like they said she went to Canada, they got married, and came back, but that was under large scrutiny about whether they were actually gay for each other or not. But that kind of shows that like the civil union thing is just to make sure like if today you had a very absolute best friend and you want to make sure that your kids and everything are safe, like you want your your fam your the rest of your family to be in good hands as well too. So civil unions can be used for that. Um, this says a special law for the partnership between two people, regardless of gender and sexuality. Um, this the fact that it is a civil union and it is, it is a unique special law in Chinese called Zhuanfa. Um, it's also the same reason why it's not fully supported by the LGBTQ community because they see this as an additional clause that's targeted just for. Um, the LGBTQ community. They're saying like this is a this is a, almost like a discriminatory um, law. So they 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 don't fully they don't fully support it. There are some people who says like well um, you know maybe like you no know, this is a step towards the right direction right. But ultimately the LGBT community still wants the the ability to be called a marriage just like everyone else. Um, this. Law also, um, there's a video on the website in Mandarin, but there's also a lot of other points that are very, very prominent as well too, because this allows for more gender equality within Taiwan. So in Taiwan, when two people get married, um, the, the wife is, the, the bride is wed to the groom's family. So then it's, a, it's, it's between two families almost, and it's kind of like the wife is, the girl is get, being given away and joining another family. Um, but because it's a partnership, it'll be only between two people, and it's not, it's like there's no, there's no um, levels to it, like, so they're equal, as equal partners. A um, lot of stuff like, for example, a uh, lot of stuff for inheritance, for example, can also be done because it's kind of like a contract. Um, this is also suitable for old couples when they have like second marriages, whether they be widow, like, widowers or they be, you know, out of a divorce kind of thing. They want to make sure that everything goes proceedingly. This is, this was adopted in Germany in 2005 as well too. There's, I, I didn't really go, go into it, but there is a whole, there was a whole legal process behind the Germany passing this in Germany as well too. Lastly is the family dependent bill. This is for two or more individuals that want to register as family. Um, this does not allow things like inheritance or adoption, but this does allow for family rights. For example, if Jacques Picou had been able to be part of the family with his with his partner, they didn't have to be part. They didn't have to be um, civil union partners. They didn't have to be married. But at the very least, if they had been family like family, then they could have had you know visitation rights and you know, consent forms, or, like anything that. A family could, a family member can do for another. Um, so this is the this is the last um, family bill. So, in overall view, there is the marriage equality bill, partnership, and the family bill as well too. Are there any questions? No. Any thoughts? I mean, uh, we want to make this. Yeah. So are these all currently like in circulation, or are there just like ideas that are running around? So um, they were they were pushed into like they were tr drafted and proposed back in 
I have this, I have the dates on the different slide, but I think it was 2004, I believe. But um, at that point, it wasn't picked up by any legislator to be proposed to the legislative UN. Um, later on, the marriage equality was pushed through um, and made it through like the first read. Uh, I'll talk about the legal proceedings afterwards, but ultimately nothing happened there. And it got proposed again, and then um, they're, they're trying to go, they're going a lot more, uh, a lot further down for the marriage equality. For partnership and the family bill, they were drafted and they're under like civil discussion, but nothing has been actually proposed and pushed through the, the legal system right now. Any questions? Any, I guess I kind of wanted to open it up to kind of like, um, what, do you, what do you guys feel about these three different kind of um, bills? Any thoughts? Um, like, what does the LGBT community feel about the family bill as opposed to the partnership? Because you said that like, they thought that the partnership bill, which I can see would be like a bit biased for specifically the LGBT community, but it seems like the family bill is like a bit more like general, so yeah. like directly targeted. But the thing with the family bills as well too is that you have to understand that it gives you family rights, but it doesn't give you like adoptions, um, inheritance, for example. So um, like the couple that we were watching earlier, um, the two, the two, the two women can become family, but they're not legally allowed to adopt the kids as well too. So there are a lot of um, things that get left out. So um, as for the support behind it, I'm not 100. percent We could probably would ask um, our speaker when new later, um, but. Uh, the one that every, the LGBTQ community is really, really pushing for is, of course, the marriage equality. It seems like the family bill is like, it would be like a step in the right direction, but without being biased. Dark. So, it seems like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, but like my personal opinion is that I feel like it does lose a lot of the legal benefits of being in a partner. Uh, and especially because if you want to be a family, you want to be like adopt kids, for example, like kids is a really big part of it. And we'll talk about later about like the oppositions and everything, like the opposition support for, for gay marriage and um, kids is a really big part of it as well. <coughs> Any questions? Thoughts? Any other thoughts? Chris, I'm talking. We're good? <laughs> All right. Um, so we can go through a little legal class, I guess, but this is going to be very, Brief, brief, hopefully. Um, so any bill is, in order to be, uh, any bill has to be proposed by a legislator. It goes through the legislative view, the entire legislative UN for um, a first read. Then, you know, once it passes first read, then um, if everyone agrees, then we can go to a second read. If, if there is even one person who disagrees, then it has to go to a smaller committee, which is like a, in Chinese called Da Hui. I think the best description is a committee. And what would happen is political parties would go through negotiations. Um, if an agreement is met, then they'll go through a second read and then a third read. And after a third read, um, I think that's when it goes to the executive, executive branch and it could be signed into as a law. So, the things that have been going on in the past. So in 2012, um, the Alliance for Partners, Partners Rights um, proposed the, uh, I've been trying to find the best translation for this and I still can't find it out. In Chinese it's called Duo Yuan Chen Jia. And essentially what it means is there's multiple ways to form a family. Uh, I realized I typoed a bit twice. But uh, originally I wrote multi-dimensional family formation or creations. <laughs> and that sounds really weird. <laughs> well, I'm like Duo Yuan man. Yeah, anyway, so, but the idea is that it is from um, different ways to form a family. It could, it could be through partners, it could be through marriage, it could be through a uh, family as well, too, to form a family. So all three drafts, um, the ones that you guys uh, we proposed, talked about earlier, was pushed, uh, proposed, but it didn't have a legislator to propose it to the actual legislature. So 2012, 2013, um, was proposed once again, and the marriage equality bill passed the first read, and then it was sent to the committee adjusted, uh, like a, a committee read, um, but up in, uh, this was pre 2016 elections. So up until then, just nothing happened. And with the new election, the entire thing just fizzles out and you have to start all over again. Then in 2016, in November, um, a proposal for, so this is, this is the most recent one, the marriage equality bill passed the first read. And so, he, um, it, so it allows for you know husband and wife or two two people to register um, as a couple, and then in 2016 in December now 
the it's passed. Um, some revisions were starting to be made to the family law, and you know, a ch additional chapter was made for the same-sex marriage. And you know, essentially, right now it's in recess. Like, oh, uh, legislative union is in recess, but this is where kind of where the current stance is. It's it's gone through. <coughs> I think, it's gone through second read. Uh, it's going to be going into through, through second read, and so um, it's still in the process, and it's essentially one more read away from potentially becoming a law. But this is how we have to wait until um, the legislative bureau, the equivalent of Congress, comes back into this, come back into session in spring. Um, so those are really quick legal things. Any questions? Um, so for the second read, is it the same kind of thing where you need everyone to agree? Yeah. Yeah. And how big is that body? Oh, I, the legislative yuan is composed of, uh, I, really know, I think, 315 legislators. Yeah. yeah. So you know everyone agrees, does it really mean like they agree with the constant of it? Yeah, pretty much. Everybody has to agree to it. Yes, this is, um, I think, the equivalent of a consensus document that if anyone went to straight talk is a Really a frustrating thing, uh, <laughs> but yes, essentially everyone has to has to agree to every single line um, like to, to figure it out. So like, if it's just like one person who just refuses to like vote, like yeah, it's like forever. I mean, this is also why like laws take forever to be passed. I mean, even the states like the like the entire process gets really really muddled, um, so it gets really hard. So I mean, we can probably I can. I could probably go find you more detailed stuff. Like, don't take don't take my word for it exactly, but like, I think that's a general consensus. All right, all right. Um, next, we're gonna look into the support and protest for marriage equality. Um, so, on the supporting side, you have, you know, human rights. It's it's um, obtain family rights, I'm allowing uh, gay couples for adoption, property ownership, and inheritance. And against it, sometimes it's family values. Um, more specifically, in Taiwan, it's a traditional what the traditional family value is. Um, Taiwan has the lowest birth rate, um, so there's an issue concern about the gay couples can't have offsprings. Um, so then, um, how would that be? You know, that would just decrease Taiwan's population, for example. That's what their argument is. And uh, lastly, is the influence of of um, their own children as well too. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but. I want to start off with, uh, oh, so talking about the, the offspring things. Um, you, you guys know what in vitro is? So like uh, surrogate mothers and like surrogate uh, families. So that's actually uh, not allowed. I think it is illegal in Taiwan. So a lot of families, they have to get um, uh, in vitro outside of Taiwan and then bring their kids back in. And then one of the parents could adopt the kid. One gets kind of left out behind. Um, so we're going to start looking at the points that are, uh, protests against the marriage equality. Um, so this is, so in, in Taiwan, like during the civil discussions, um, the government would, would invite a large number of different um, representatives from different groups. And essentially everyone has some, a lot of amount of time to go on stage and kind of talk about um, why they support or don't support a certain law. So this is from, uh, I, I forgot which group she's in, but the full video talks about it. But I'm going to take a clip, the last big clip of it, that when she starts summarizing a lot of her, her, her beliefs. Yao 这种婚姻同性婚姻对现在的社会没有迫害
，社会人口已经越来越少了。统计的结果，你说你要收养小孩，哪来这么多小孩给你收养？亲生的孩子，你才有那个血缘关系去爱他；收养的孩子，你能这样的爱他吗？当收养的父母拆散，当收养的父母拆伙的时候，还是要归谁呢？孩子，这个当人从旁来旁去，还是被讲来讲去。哈哈哈哈哈！为难自然，道德上有正义，还要用立法去给他正当性，这是我们不能接受。So this is um, so this is I mean this this there's a video like in the very beginning it talks about <laughs> and the person who posted this video was is. Very against what she's saying, um, so she tr wanted to translate to English so that people can kind of see her, the the video person's beliefs to be a, a terrible reason. Um, but essentially, a lot of it talks about you know, family values, and um, I'm not gonna get into the whole loving your kids thing. I'm gonna get past that one. Um, so the one thing that they, that she does mention is what's called the Gender Equity Education Act. So this kind of goes into um, people are worried about what this could affect their own kids as well, too. So a lot, a lot of times the questions are like, oh, well, you know, I'm getting married. Why does that affect you? Like, you know, it doesn't matter to you. But people sometimes they talk about the, their, um, their offspring. So in 2004, Gender Equity Education Act passed through. In the general sense, this is about, you know, making sure that, um, that no matter what gender you are, boys or girls, um, men or women, have the same education, um, ability to get the same education. Um, there are, there are, except for example, like, you know, you can't discriminate based on your gender. A couple of schools in Taiwan are same sex, uh, like only boys school or girls schools. And those, because they have historical backings, like they're, like they're kind of passed through with this, but other schools essentially are up to the standard of, you know, marriage, uh, gender equality. However, this also adds into promote some, um, stand, um, uh, yeah, so, so just overall gender equality. But at the same time, they're also taught about non-traditional gender identifications and orientation too. So that means in a certain class, whether it, I'm going to assume that it's health class, um, essentially they can talk about what a gender is, what, what, what makes a man a man, what makes a woman a woman. But they essentially would start to say, oh, you don't have to, like, you, biologically, a man doesn't mean you have to be a man. You can choose to identify to be a female. Um, to, I'm trying to find the right words here because there's a, male and female are biological. You can choose to be a woman. Um, so then, like they're bringing it out there, and people are concerned that this kind of education about um, you know different genders, um, the fact that gender, uh, the fact that what you identify with your gender is by nurture, not by nature. Um, some people are not that happy. They feel like, oh, our kids might start experimenting um, with being gay, um, or you know, or hey, maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm really not a man. Maybe I'm more of a woman kind of thing. So people are concerned about that. Also, Taiwan's sex education and you know, gender equity education is actually also very lacking as well. Too, the main part being there is there's very few specialists that can teach this area. A lot of times, it's just bring in doctors. For example, um, there was one incident where a doctor was brought in and he started teaching things that were just um, reinforcing gender stereotypes. And it's like, oh, a man is stronger and a woman so like they're not smart or whatever. And so like, it causes issues like that. So. Um, this leads into a bigger question of sex education as well, too. Um, but this is the reason why people are very concerned as to their how their offsprings get get introduced to gender equity, uh, to like sexual orientation, um, and uh, yeah, sexual orientation. Um, so then the next bit that I want to talk about is um, support for marriage equality. So I found this clip. Someone also start put closed captions into this, so it's it's kind of hard to find clips in Taiwan in English. Um, but this, so Taiwan, like in America, a lot of times people who oppose gay marriage are from the Christian right. There's a lot of um, Christian values and everything. Um, people say that America is built on Christian values and stuff like that. However, in Taiwan, the Christian population is only between four to six percent. So it's a very, very low. Majority of Taiwan are, you know, Buddhist, Taoist, or some mix of that, or some sort of um, more, um, I don't know the English word to it, but like memes to like, it's like a whole mix of weird, um, if you really want to say it, potentially pagan, but um, essentially like um, 
non-Christians. Um, but this is a video from a Buddhist, uh, I guess like a master, I don't know what her title is, but in Chinese it's called Fa Si. Oh, whoops, that's not it. That's not, that's not the Buddhist person. Can you guys see the caption? Oh, I, I was going to end a little bit earlier, but um, this I'm actually really curious about because she's talking about that there's a lot of the old text, there's a lot about like man, woman, or man, man, woman, woman kind of thing. Don't have the basis for this, so I'm, I was going to present that. But um, essentially, she's coming saying that from a Buddhist point of view, there is really no reason to oppose uh, marriage equalities or oppose gays. Um, there are there are amongst other, there are other Buddhists that are against marriage equality as well too, uh, but on the flip side, there are also few, but like a couple of Christian Christian groups that also support gay marriage as well too. So one of them is called the Tongguang Tongguang Church, same light church. There are the um, civil groups and their support and um, kind of protest against marriage equality. Any questions? All right. Uh, next, we're going to go into um, some more public supports from politicians. So um, this guy in the middle is um, uh, Ma Ying-jeou. Um, this picture was taken when he was still mayor. So when he was mayor in 1998, he became the first politician to support gay rights. Um, he was he allocated a million U.S. dollars um, to the LGBTQ rights movement and another 800,000 U.S. dollars for um, research-related issues as well. Um, however, in 2012, um, when, he elected, when he was elected president, um, he did not push the, the gay rights into any legal issues as well, too. So he did say that he respects gay marriage, but he did not push for the legalization of it. Um, next is, uh, this is President Tsai um, Ing-wen. Uh, through my readings, there were saying, um, Early on, he didn't seem that friendly to the gay community. Um, however, in 2002, this was not, um, this, so this picture actually wasn't publicized largely by the media because it wasn't announced that he was doing this, but he invited um, gay rights activists, um, uh, gay rights activist Nam Hunter and human rights lawyer Michael Bronsky, who are both very prominent in like, the US gay rights movement, and invited them to the, to the presidential office to have discussions and talks with them. So um, this, wasn't, this wasn't as publicized, but uh, this showed that he was interested in the areas to try to push for um, gay rights. Um, 2003, um, President Chen, Vice President Annette Liu, drafted a basic human rights law that included an article for same-sex marriage and adoption rights for gay couple, but that, um, that law didn't pass. Then we go into the most current president. This is um, President Tsai Ing-wen. So this is a little, a little bit mentioned in the news article. <laughs> so it's essentially saying like, um, I support gay marriage. I want everyone, everyone, no matter who they are, to, to, to you know, obtain love and you know, get the rights that they want. This video was pushed out on October 30th in 2015, and it was what it was what day before the uh, the Pride Parade in Taiwan. This was also a little over two months before the election. So um, 
so P, the, the LGBT community was very excited. You know, this is, um, she's running for president. Like, in, like, for example, let's say in America, when someone's running for president and they have a very s strong view on one area or the other, you potentially could lose votes or, and whatnot. But it um, potentially through calculation, but um, essentially this is the first time, like during a campaign, someone's like, oh, I support gay rights. Um, leads up to now. So she was inaugurated in 2006. Uh, she, the election went through and she was inaugurated in May of 2016. And so right now the Marriage Equality Act is passed through second read, but it needs to pass through a third read. Um, this is in, towards the end of April or May uh, when the legislative run comes back into session. Um, the, 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 the reason why the last, the last marriage equality bill that I was trying to get passed had to be reset was because there was a new election. So if this drags on and it was just left in third readers and passage, just in the process of it, and until another three years and the next election comes around, then this will have to start from ground zero once again. Um, so revisions of the family law, are they're undergoing um, constitutional clarification by the judicial branch. So they're looking at how the family law can be changed to, to accommodate for the Marriage Equality Act too. So that's also being the process. Um, currently, um, this is, this tweet was sent out a couple of 18th um, President Tsai invited President Tsai and um, the vice uh, vice president Chen um, invited supporters and protesters of the marriage equality act to come to the presidential office to kind of discuss about their differences and their stories um, one thing is to be noted as well too um, vice um, so Tsai, I don't know what relig how religious Tsai is but the vice president Chen, he is a prominent Catholic. Uh, he's a prominent Catholic. He's he's oftentimes spoken about being a very devout Catholic. So when questioned about you know how he's going to balance his Catholic views against um, the marriage equality, he says that you know we must put the Taiwanese culture and the family um, marriage values first, but at the same time make sure that um, the gay community, the human rights, are protected as well too. So it's kind of like you know. We'll, we'll see how the Taiwan community decides. Um, so that's the, from the vice president. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, um, we have a couple additional readings. Um, I can pass these slides out, um, to send it out a little bit later. Um, there's a lot of readings. I picked these out as ones that are a little bit more, uh, more informational and not necessarily as much like fighting back and forth, either support, like, you know, yelling in the support or protest against it. So um, in general, um, for those who came in a little bit later, I, the, the part that I, I guess really want to, you know, the three different bills that are being passed that are hoped for by the, the gay community, marriage equality bill, the partnership bill, and the family bill. So um, these all fulfill different areas. They have their pros and their cons, um, and there are difficulties of getting through you know, the legislative union as well, too. But once the legislative union comes back into, comes back into session, going about it again too. There, there's a huge, um, there's a lot of articles that start, start coming up, especially from the gay community saying like, oh, Tsai was only using the gay, the gay promotion, supporting it just to kind of get that boost for the elections. And she's been stalling out on, on actually getting anything done. Um, one, one writer, he's a French Canadian writer, um, he lives in Taiwan, Jim Michael Cole, he's, He's, um, I wanted to get him to a little video or have a chance to talk to you guys. Um, I, if you guys have a chance, his, his writings are a little bit, uh, is very strong, very strong support of the LGBTQ community. So he's French Canadian and his parents got divorced and his mom married another woman back in 2003. So he's, um, he's like, you know, a lot of times he goes like, oh, there's nothing wrong with, I've seen this happen, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, my dad also makes, I, I hope my mom for, for you know, the best that she can be as well too. So if you guys have a chance, her, his writings are a little bit strong sometimes, but it comes from a more potentially non-Taiwanese, like he, he lived in Taiwan for a long time, but like um, from an outside, potential outside view. So these are a couple of um, links. And um, before we get into the small interview and Q&A with our speaker, um, Liu Wen, um, does anyone have any questions for me? I can answer them best to my knowledge. Any questions? Anything that's weird or doesn't like want to question about or comment about thoughts? 
Yep. So is there like a difference between, like what is the geographic culture differences like across, like Taipei is obviously different from like other parts of Taiwan. So how does hmm. that factor into this? That's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think we can probably ask them when you afterwards as well too. Yeah, that's the question. So, um, with that note, um, we will. I will try to get. Uh, I'll get. So, kind of sh shortly, just to introduce um, the speaker that we're going to talk to. This is um, Wen Liu. She's a doctoral candidate at, of psych in psychology at CUNY in New York, and also she is. She teaches gender and sexuality at um, Sarah Lawrence College as well too. Um, yeah, uh, I hope she's on, and we will, I will see how we're going to get this to work. All right. Take this out, and I will put this up, and I will not have my face in this. Oh, Oh, we're just losing everything. Um, oh, just, oh, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, all right, don't be shy, guys. I'm assuming that's her pinging me. Nope, she says she's here, and um, let me see. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, It's a lot of it's a lot of fat. Yeah, it's a lot of fat because you use fatty and usually you use fatty pork. Wait, Leon, can you? Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. There's... Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Get your food, get your food. All right. Um, let's not see our faces. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you wanted to see yourself. <laughs> all right. Sorry. They're all getting food right now. <laughs> Okay, guys. Okay. All right. Um, so this is um, Wen Liu. She is involved in 
the LGBTQ community, and um, she teaches about this. So if there's any questions, ask her about it. Um, she also, I actually met Wendy through a lot of um, other activism stuff about Taiwan too. So if there are other questions about um, activism, like civil, like civil movement, stuff like that, I'm sure um, Wendy can also help out as well too. So um, I guess, Wendy, do you want to start with just talking about how, what it is in Taiwan, LGBT community and stuff like that, and the movement? Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Is, is, is my voice clear? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, so, so I'm your I'm queer your person, person for the day. day. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I came so I just a little bit about myself. myself. I came to the I U.S. when I was when 16. Um, so I kind of been through high school, undergrad, and now um, graduate school here. But I also move back and forth between um, Seattle, New York, and because well, my family's there, so I still have a really strong connection to the communities there. Um, and so, but based on my knowledge, um, I think the LGBT community in Taiwan now is, um, you know, is is very diverse um, compared to when the time I left Taiwan. I think right now, um, you can really see LGBT communities everywhere. Right now, the cafe culture, the bookstore culture, um, the bar culture. I mean. Um, basically, you don't have to go to an LGBTQ specific cafe or places to know that. I mean, there will be mostly be LGBTQ friendly. Um, so that's a really good, I think, advancement, you no, know, um, culturally. Um, and we're talking about maybe in the 90s when um, LGBTQ culture um, has just first started to become a thing. It was mostly in academia. Um, kind of similar to what's really what went on uh, in the U.S. before. So um, academic culture was all still, I mean, uh, a part, a big part of the LGBTQ discourse. But now uh, I think what's different is that it's being expanded beyond academia and the sort of more um, scholarly discussion. Um, so it's uh, there's a lot more sort of entertainment, uh, you know, consumer culture. Uh, so a lot of people would critique that, but then in a way also uh, make LGBTQ culture uh, sort of more going into the mainstream. So if you look at um, a lot of those sort of singer, um, kind of like American Idol show, right? People compete for uh, the singing ability. You'll see a lot of the uh, queer, you know, suspect, you know, um, um, people who join the show. And then uh, and it's kind of, you know, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll actually be out. And most of the time they're not, but uh, it's part of the entertainment now for sure. So, so, I guess. Anyone have any Eric? questions? Well, one of the questions that was brought up earlier was um, whether there are differences to LGBT acceptances depending on which county you're from, like Taipei versus like Taizong, Gaosho, mm -hmm. or like Bingzong, something like that. Uh, um, I mean, Taipei definitely just because um, it has a, most of the cultural resources, so it's still uh, the biggest center. But I would say now, in um, so I think you talked about the parade, right? So right now, uh, in most of the major cities, there's a parade uh, every year, and, and they're in different time. So kind of such a big LGBT type of parade in Queens, a parade in Brooklyn, or maybe three parade in Brooklyn, and then two in Manhattan, right? So uh, it's kind of also what's going on in Taiwan. And now also uh, in the East Coast, like Hualien, Taidong, right, uh, Ilan, all these places, uh, I mean, they're now sort of burgeoning LGBT communities as well. So, I mean, I think because the geographical differences in Taiwan in a way, it, they're pretty, I mean, it can be seen as pretty drastic, but because how small Taiwan is, I think, uh, all this stuff is really easy to just travel across different places. Right. Um, um, so then, how, we talked a little bit about um, the, mm -hmm. the politicians that went through, you know, partially, like, for example, like, uh, mine just threw his support for the gay rights, but only as Taipei mayor, um, since we invited gay rights activists in, and then now with Time when um, when she announced her support mm. for the for marriage equality, um, I think it came to be uh, for me when I saw it, I thought I was really surprised because it was very different political scene that I've seen compared to what I've known about Taiwan. Um, but in your experience, you know, what you your take and the communities like what you feel the sentiment is in terms of 
how she's doing, you know, um, now, like, is she really pushing for it? Was she just stalling? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see the situation as right now? Right. I mean, right now, I think a lot of people are really pissed off by Tsai ing to be honest. Because, um, you know, during her election last year, I mean, uh, I mean, even the overseas community, we really rallied a lot of support just because she was this person who talked about LGBTQ rights, she talked about, you know, transitional justice for indigenous folks. Uh, she talks about increasing, you know, um, better labor protection for, uh, especially for younger workers who just entering to, uh, you know, labor the first time. So she talked all about this sort of social justice issues, but then um, what she really gave us, I mean, was really, really disappointing. And uh, there was just a meeting, I think, that happened last month, right, between um, and the LGBTQ rights supporters but also uh, the sort of religious rights group were against it. And she basically said that in power, she feel like the LGBTQ marriage equality, I mean, the marriage equality movement should wait, should not be, you know, so um, hurry, right? That And um, the DPP party, which, you know, Tsai is part of and a leader of, um, now they are drafting a bill, um, a civil union bill, so it's not marriage, uh, but provides some kind of rights uh, that the married couples would uh, enjoy and it's only targeted for, um, you know, same-sex couples. So I think the, the party is trying to push for that bill uh, instead of the marriage equality bill. So I think that really, uh, I mean, a lot of people were not happy with it. I mean, just because, uh, right, I mean, separate is not equal, right? I mean, I think we all know that. But also, it's really ridiculous how this specific sort of civil union uh, uh, for same-sex couple, you ask, you know, the couples, which one of you is the husband, which one of you is the wife? You just really <laughs> ridiculous and backwards and totally, you know, gender insensitive, um, I guess, you know, a piece of legislature. So we're really hoping that that's not uh, what's going to come down to it. You know, um, I think, yeah, this month now uh, when the court is opening again. So then do you, like, um, in terms of the civil, the civil union bill, and um, obviously the marriage equality bill is getting the most pushback from the religious groups. Um, but then there's the civil union group is not, the civil union bill is not as accepted in the LGBTQ community. And what about the, the family dependent one, the family dependent bill as well too? Like how, is it, how does mm -hmm. the community see these two other bills that um, could potentially go through? Right, so what happened is that, um I mean, I think you talked about um, the, the bill that went through the second reading, right? And that was actually only the marriage equality bill. So the two other bills you talked about, the partnership one and the family, uh, Dorian Jating, I mean, uh, those two actually were not part of, um, I mean, they were kind of presented as a package, but what really happened in the legislative end is that they were only looking at um, the marriage equality bill. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there are two kinds of um, discourse around that, right? I mean, some, some of the more progressive folks would say uh, marriage is a fucked up institution, so why would queer people want to participate in it? Uh, especially in Taiwan, uh, marriage still um, um, includes, uh, what, what is it called? Um, that you have to be loyal, sexually loyal to your partner. Yeah, I forgot what I was in English, uh, but... Um, sorry? Yeah. Uh, like it's, the, it's a concern of adultery. Um, adultery. Right, adultery, yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, so a lot of the more kind of progressive feminists or sex liberation folks would say, yeah, why do we want that, right? Um, you know, um, to participate in uh, a bill that still punish adultery, right? Um, so a lot of people are actually more uh, pushing for the other bill, right? The partnership rights and the family, right? And also uh, some people argue like the family structure, the, you know, diverse family structure could allow uh, you know, people with disability, if I have a living home care, right, then we can be some kind of family without the necessary romantic or sexual uh, commitment, right, but we're still pretty much function as a, you know, social unit as a family. So those bills can actually be, um, you know, um, I guess, had wider um, contribution, I mean, to people who are not just uh, same sex uh, in same sex relationship. So um, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean, I think most of the energy now is focused on the marriage equality bill. Uh, now I think the Supreme Court is going to make a decision in March if it's uh, go through with the 
uh, procedure, right? So we'll see if that fails, maybe people trying to, um, you know, fight, uh, you know, for other alternatives like the partnership bill, the family bill, uh, not yet. I mean, I, I feel like we potentially could push both the marriage equality and the civil, the cival union mm -hmm. together. I mean, because that seems to be kind of beneficial to a large yeah. number of people too. So, yeah. Right, uh, but then the I mean the the, the question I mean the, the question now is just that uh, the DPP's version of the civil union bill that is only targeted for same sex couples, so it doesn't even allow straight people who just like. Oh, I, I really fucking hate marriage. I just wanted to live with you and have some kind of benefit. It doesn't even allow that. So a lot of people say it's you know it's a kind of homophobic gesture that the state is trying to still separate the populations. Uh, so if if the civil union bill was like the partnership bill was going to be reproposed again and mm -hmm. acceptable for the LGBT community, it would be a bigger bill to encompass everything, not just for same sex marriage, right? Right. Hopefully, yeah. But I think that a lot of people are really obsessed with, you know, uh, this idea of marriage, which is, you know, culturally still holds a lot of weight in Taiwan, right? To be able to marry and inherit uh, money and be able to adopt. So I think it's still going to, you know, make a lot of people sad if marriage equality doesn't pass this month. Yeah. Um, I think there was, I think that's most of the question. Does anyone have, yeah? So in a lot of the, also hi, thanks for you know speaking for us. With us. Yeah, of course. <laughs> in a lot of the things that we watch, we see people in opposition who say a lot of things that are fairly similar to what gets said in America. Like, mm -hmm. opposition is like, oh, you know, every kid needs like a parent of both genders, or it's like, oh, like, you know, family, or whatever. A lot of these are similar to what we hear in America. What do you think are some of the things that are mm -hmm. unique in Taiwan specifically, and like, challenging to talk about parts because of that. Right, yeah, it's an interesting observation. And uh, a lot of my colleagues who do research on uh, the religious right are positioned. And I mean, it's being really evident that uh, a lot of the discourses are transnational, right? I mean, they're coming from a particular sort of ideology in the US and transported to South Korea. You know, the Christian population is also very, very powerful there, to Hong Kong is also. Uh, the Christians' right controlling a lot of resources and then import it to Taiwan. So this is a whole sort of transnational circle, you know, circulation of um, right-wing homophobic discourses. So yeah, um, and uh, I don't know what's unique about Taiwan. I think um, um, I'm just, sometimes I'm a little bit wary to say that there is this division of the East and West culture um, because I do think that... Um, uh, Culturally, culturally essentialist argument just say that well because Taiwanese parents or Taiwanese families uh, care about this Confucianist model more so they want uh, the kids to inherit uh, you know the money to carry out the family line in a way that I think a lot of the rich and families also really care about right so it's hard to make that distinction but uh, I do think the uh, very particular challenge is because um, to me is about uh, the kind of ambiguous sovereign or national stand, stance of Taiwan as a government itself, right? I mean, we have uh, a lot of the um, trans trans transitional justice issue that should be done, but have not been able to do it because uh, our government, first of all, is not completely uh, functioning in a, in a sort of normal way. Right, and then now uh, a lot of the issues, just the issues, is um, split between the so-called like KMT DPP line. Uh, so it's really hard, I think, for uh, the Taiwanese public or in a political circle to have an actual rational, uh, sort of fair conversation about marriage equality, right, without talking about um, 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 as a nation, right. And I think a lot of the younger generation really wants to. Promote LGBTQ want ourselves um, to get some kind of recognition, uh, some uniqueness of Taiwan as a country. Uh, so a lot of people are pushing in that way. But it can also be why there's a lot of oppositions that really doesn't want um, right Taiwan to have this right to be farther away from the so-called uh, you know the East Asia cultural China. So 
um, I think, yeah, I think things really complex. And I, I think one thing I'll talk about also, I think particular to Taiwan, uh, is not so much culturally, but also economically. Um, so people pay attention to the news probably know that Taiwan's economy has been, you know, really suffered in the past years, right? A lot of young people, uh, college, for people to live outside of the home uh, because such a lower standard of you know uh, salary and the higher uh, living expenses so just think about that like if you only have very little money you can't even afford uh, a place of your own oh, sorry how can you have a partnership right how can you even have a family so um, I think a lot of the issue that we're facing now is not just about um, marriage rights but it's about sort of uh, economic standard it's about uh, you know, the, uh, so to have a livable career, I think uh, those are really important things for LGBTQ rights as well. But it's not as often talked about. Yeah, um, one of the things um, that uh, me and most couple of my friends were when we talk about LGBTQ like marriage mm -hmm. equality as well is that um, if Taiwan were to, I mean, it'd be very momentous if Taiwan became the first Asian country to legalize um, gay marriage. But at the same time, it also, um, in Taiwan, you can almost find any single piece of law or social issue and link it somehow to Taiwan and China. So, but the, essentially mm -hmm. the thing is, if right. Taiwan does allow gay marriage, you know, China is still very harsh on um, um, gay, gay community as well, too. So that kind of really does separate Taiwan and a huge difference between Taiwan and China as well, too. And to what Wen was talking about in terms of transitional justice, does anyone not know what transitional justice is talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so essentially, like, um, just a refresher, I guess, like, um, Taiwan is, this could be a whole other topic, but essentially, in, in a nutshell, it's, um, it's an external government that came over to Taiwan, and it's very, there are a lot of things that have been investigated before, like a couple of this, you know, on Monday, on Tuesday was 228, for example, like things that, things that have happened in the past in terms of Taiwanese history has never been really followed up on. So Taiwan's government, and like it's, earlier I was talking about sexual, like sex education, for example, a lot of this stuff is not even established properly within Taiwan's government, first and foremost. Um, introducing, I think some people would be saying, like introducing something new to this slightly dysfunctional government is a little bit too, too much. Would that be safe to say, Wen? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any, other, any other questions? Um, so, like, I feel like one of the main uh, issues for people that aren't supporting uh, uh, equality of marriage in Taiwan would be, like, the like deeply rooted like traditional Asian beliefs of like that like you know like a good and like happy household like requires a husband and a wife. So like how would you go about like I don't know like starting to like convince these uh, people that like or like convince them that these beliefs like are not true or like that because like it's such like a you know like it's such like a deeply rooted Asian tradition in like having like a husband and a wife and a family together. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And well, if you if you watch any sort of popular Taiwanese media, right, a, a, lot, a lot of those talk shows, you can just see like how prevalent those sort of heteronormative, right? I mean, so in Taiwanese popular culture, and I don't know how to convince them. I think the feminist movement as well, because I mean, we have um, still a lot of crazy patriarchal beliefs about uh, you know a wife's space right um, a wife and um, I mean now when women earn just not enough to feed a family it's, it's a sort of a rational um, uh, changes that's go that's been going on but it doesn't mean that uh, there's not this I mean the belief of that the patriarchal household right so the importance to have a husband um, and to have children and then the wife is the one who take care of you know uh, the social reproductive needs of the children and the family I mean those are still very very strong and um, I don't think LGBTQ movement in Taiwan you know can exist without pushing those boundaries um, and I mean there's a lot of a lot of things has been going on right so uh, you know 
people probably don't know, but in Taiwan, uh, you can choose right your last name, uh, a lot, even though a lot of people don't practice it. So, but uh, it's actually legal, right? That you can uh, decide that you I don't have to go with my father's last name. So that was pushed, uh, you know, by the feminist um, movement, you know, just a couple of years ago. So that there was that, uh, and now people are also pushing for. Um, uh, when we talked about like the adultery thing, right? Because that was still, it's a pretty sort of sexist uh, idea, right? That the woman has to remain loyal sexually to the husband. So hopefully with those uh, different things going on simultaneously, that can also push for just widen people's beliefs about gender and sexuality. Yeah, wait, so wait, in Taiwan, a, a man cannot be sexually loyal? Well, they can, but they're usually not, you know, as often punished, right? Oh, wow. Even though it's stated in gender neutral way, but it's you know <laughs> most of the times the wife is being punished. So it's it's really Taiwan has a gender equity yeah. issue first and foremost, right? Yeah, I think huge. Yeah, even though we have a female president, but mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like speaking from my personal experiences, like I grew up in a very traditional household in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like there are some things that my family might say that I'm like, whoa, that's not the way you should be saying it. Um, there are, mm -hmm. even in like the media too, you'll oftentimes see a lot of, um, there are a lot of comments that come out in the Taiwanese media that gets passed off. I was doing some research and I didn't, I didn't want to put a club up because I, it was kind of not necessarily about Taiwan. So there's, um, the Taiwanese version of the Grammy is called the, the Golden Bell Award. And um, I think it was like, I think two years ago, I think, um, um, this guy, I think his name is David Lin. Um, he's from he's from China, and he won the Golden Bell Award. And on stage, he you know he thanked God. He you know which is really normal. We see that at the Oscars you know, all the time and everything too. However, um, in the post post award um, like interviews, people were interviewing and stuff like that. He straight up like in front of all the cameras. You know, this is an actor. Mm -hmm. First off, he goes like. Gay people should not exist. Like, it is absolutely wrong. I will not participate in any film produced or directed by a gay person because that means I support what they're doing and everything. And this guy has also been reported to have changed a certain. Like, there was a scene that he was required to like a like a, make, like a kiss scene between two him and another guy, and he was able to have enough pull to not get that being like made in the in the in the show. How many though? I think he was just a. Best actor for a web series. Mm. <laughs> I think that's what it was, right? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think in, in general in Taiwan, there's a lot of uh, gender equity issues. Period. Yeah, and there's also this. I think in the U.S. too, though, like this, um, because you talked about the lower birth rates in Taiwan. I think in the U.S. too, right? The birth rate is pretty low. I mean, any sort of events. Western country, but then in Taiwan, this is a like glamorized version of giving birth and having job like commodities, right? I mean, you can see all this celebrity culture really, yeah, glamorized like this kind of, I think, still pretty patriarchal ideas. And another thing about Taiwan is that the entertainment uh, circle, right? All the celebrities you see, uh, a huge portion of them are in this version church, like Jay Chao. You know, I mean, he's he is against gay marriage and basically against LGBT rights. So you have you know access to media. Uh, I mean, they're actually all for this. Them doing a background, some of them come out um, in the awards. Uh, yeah, it's it's really intense. Like how. Uh, connected those powers are. Mm -hmm. I think there's one more question. Right? Another question? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're out of the time, are we? Well, I mean, I don't know. Are we out of no. I think, yeah. Oh, okay. So in America, for example, uh, the rights of transgender people is an issue that's gaining visibility and hopefully gaining ground. Are, is anything similar happening in Taiwan on that, in that respect? Uh, for for trans folks, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, now there's a more visible, you know, trans community that also work with you know the intersex community. So they're kind of fighting for what you talked about, right? To be covered by health insurance, 
uh, for transition access to hormone for you know gender reassignment surgery. I mean, still it's it's slowly going on. I mean, I don't think it's been uh, there's no sort of official policy yet, but I think I've heard those discourses in the movements. Yeah, there's definitely that connection. Yep. Are there any um, like government funded like <coughs> public programs that support the LGBT community in Taiwan? Um, yeah, I mean, so what's really interesting about I think the Taiwan's NGO uh, nonprofit circle is that most of them are partially founded by the state. The U.S. is mostly privately found. Foundation Taiwan, most of them get from the government. So uh, one of the biggest one is called um, the Hotline, uh, Tongzhi Hotline, uh, which is the old LGBTQ organization. Uh, and now they have an office not only in Taipei, but also uh, in Kaohsiung, right, the south uh, center of Taiwan. So they do uh, uh, you know, um, they do um, HIV stuff. They also do a lot of the sort of social events, organizing um, parades. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then, uh, and then there's also because uh, sort of made a lot of different um, circles. Of, um, it's called Xiao Mi Feng, which is like little bees. <laughs> so it's like. Um, Pockets of communities, just when place needs an action, uh, that a lot of the young folks would just go there and do some kind of direct action. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's pretty. Um, so that I think that part of it, you know, that's oh. been growing, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions? Or? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, when thank you for taking your time out. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thank you, you guys. All right. And uh, last couple of bits, I'm going to do self plug. Um, but um, essentially, Irish Taiwan, um, you know, thank you guys for having us here. This is um, the debut of this this one workshop and this talk. And uh, from my personal, uh, from my view, I think it actually went pretty well. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> not to my own voice, but anyways, um, you know, so essentially, um, we do do a lot of other, like, we do do a other, other, lot of other topics as well, too. I know last time when we came up here, it was a lot, a very big general thing, but we're trying to focus on down on small specific topics. So if there's any questions, um, let us know. We have a website, irishtalent.org, and our Facebook group. And, um, yeah, um, we also have a survey called We Get Feedback, so we can also improve ourselves, too. So... Uh, probably, uh, oh, yeah, you can send me everything. Yeah, so I'll send it to you, and then um, hopefully you guys can give us a little feedback, and uh, hopefully we can be back in Brown. Thank you, Thank guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.